Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 2018 AERA President Deborah Lowenberg Ball and also the 2018 AERA Annual Meeting Program Chairs, Carla O'Connor and Suzanne Wilson. everyone. Um, we'd like to welcome you to New York City to the 2018 annual meeting of AERA and especially to this opening plenary where we will set the tone for our deliberations about this year's theme and also think about our future work in relation to that theme. Great. Where's mine? We want to start by thanking Deborah, Carla, and I want to start by thanking all the AER staff who have helped us this past year. Felice Levine, and countless others who we can't possibly name everyone because only a few people had to deal with us on a daily basis, but they include Robert Smith, Tony Pals, um, a lot of people who we met today, Kayla, Ava, Colin, um, Sylvie, and we're deeply appreciative for their help in putting this program together. It would not help happen without them. They are our unsung heroes. Good evening, everyone. Let me add my welcome. And I just would like to ask you to take a moment to join me in thanking all of the staff in this hotel and across all of the sites of this meeting who are laboring invisibly and sometimes visibly to make this meeting run as smoothly and as wonderfully as it is. They're all over. And if you could also not only thank them now, but as you see people across the course of the meeting, take the time to greet them, to thank them for the work they're doing. Can we all thank, thank them together? Right now? We stand today in what we now call New York City, a place that many, the peoples of many nations have traveled to and formed connections with since time immemorial. We recognize the Lenape Nation in whose homeland, Manahata, we are guests today. And we recognize as well the Haudenosaunee and the Shinnecock Nation who have long-standing relationships with the land and the waters that we now call New York. New York is an important site for our annual meeting for all it represents in the history of our nation. Many immigrant groups think of New York as the portal through which they entered the United States, fleeing oppression or hate or seeking new opportunities. For black people, it was a destination in the great northern migration across several decades in the 20th century. While many different groups have occupied and stood on this site, we must remember that it was and still is indigenous land. We must honor this land and the waters that surround us, and we must honor the people whose land this is. Yesterday afternoon, <laughs> yesterday afternoon, two special interest groups in AARA, the Indigenous Peoples of the Americas SIG and the Indigenous Peoples of the Pacific SIG, held a pre-conference in which they engaged in a ceremony in order to begin the conference by recognizing that we are guests on this land and to acknowledge the people on whose lands we are. This is a crucial ethical gesture on behalf of all of us at the conference that indigenous members of AERA have carried out for almost 15 years. I deeply appreciate that this happens every year and I hope that this tradition will become more visible and that more conference participants can enter each meeting each year with this critical awareness and appreciation of the indigenous contributions as well as the injustices that they suffer. As we honor the Lenape people on whose land this year's AER meeting, a meeting takes place, we must be conscious of our responsibilities as an organization as well as, as educators, scholars, activists, to work to elevate the health and well-being of all indigenous peoples who have been oppressed in their own lands. This year's conference theme, as you know, focuses our attention on public education. For indigenous peoples, the dream of publication, public education has not been a reality. In fact, the promise of upward social mobility through the imposition of English language and culture at the expense of indigenous languages and cultures is a myth for indigenous people. Let's take our consciousness of this forward throughout the meeting 
and let us remember to acknowledge the peoples and the land on which this meeting site takes place. Thank you. I'd like to take a minute to frame uh, the session that you've all come um, to hear. We hope that over the next few days, people will take advantage of the myriad opportunities to learn from sessions, speakers, and events. Our theme, the dreams, possibility, and necessity of public education, asks our community to recognize, organize, and mobilize our knowledge and experience to imagine a public education that we do not yet have. Critical and open imagination is vital to this project of looking forward, of learning to make new ideas and new approaches. We must imagine a world that does not currently exist, a world that honors and values difference. The imagination needed for this work entails humility and inspiration from past and present efforts in the struggle for justice. So our logic here is that we've, we have an opening plenary session in which we welcome an esteemed panel of educators, researchers, activists, and historians who will engage in a conversation with one another about public education, about its central role in our struggle for justice, and the lessons that we might learn from those who came before us and who are doing this work today. During their conversation, we um, invite you to submit any questions that you might have. Deborah, Carla, and I will stand in the back of the room, and if you have a question, just put it on a piece of paper or a card, wave your hand. We'll come scurry over to you and grab it, and then give them to the moderator. Um, we also invite you to tweet when the panelists are, um, come up to the stage. We've made sure that everybody's handle is, uh, will be um, on the um, backdrop so that you can easily do that and remember hashtag AERA2018. Now we go down. I now have the honor of introducing our esteemed panel. They will be coming up one at a time and I will share um, a brief insight into their wonderful background and expertise. And there, as indicated by Suzanne, um, their handles will be listed on the screen so that you can use them uh, when tweeting. So with that, I'd like to begin by introducing Eve Tuck. Eve Tuck is Associate Professor of Critical Race and Indigenous Studies at the University of Toronto. Named the 2017 Canada Research Chair of Indigenous Methodologies and Youth Communities, Dr. Tuck examines how Indigenous social thought can be engaged to create fairer and more just social policy, more meaningful social movements, and robust approaches to decolonization. Dr. Tuck is Unanga and from the Aleut community of St. Paul Island. Sheldon Danzinger is next joining her. Dr. Danzinger is currently the president of the Russell Sage Foundation. He was formerly the Henry J. Meyer Distinguished University Professor of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. Dr. Danzinger has examined trends in poverty and inequality throughout his career and how governmental programs intersect with economic and demographic changes to affect disadvantaged groups. Prudence Carter will now be joining the panel. Prudence Carter is the Dean of the Graduate School of Education at UC Berkeley, a sociologist with expertise in urban poverty, black youth identity, and race, class, and gender stratification in schools. Dr. Carter's research and teaching agenda focus on, focuses on causes of and solutions to enduring social and cultural inequalities in schools and education. The panel will be joined by Bob Moses. Bob Moses is a prominent figure 
in the, was a prominent figure in the civil rights movement and was the field secretary of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Recognizing that math literacy, like reading and writing, is necessary for full citizenship, Mr. Moses founded the Algebra Project, which uses mathematics as an organizing tool to ensure quality public education for every child in America. And now welcome Patricia Bacuadando Lopez. Patricia Bacuadando Lopez is associate professor in the Graduate School of Education at UC Berkeley. Her research illuminates the intersection of language, race, and immigration in schools. Her more recent research, recent interest in <clears throat> her more recent interests in return, return migration transnational families and education in the Maya diaspora is evidenced in a multi-year ethnography of the educational experiences of indigenous Mayan students and families in Yucatan, California. Chris Edley is the last member of the panel Chris Edley is the Honorable William H. Oreck Jr. Distinguished Professor at the UC Berkeley School of Law, and he is also the co-founder and president of the Opportunity Institute. Dr. Edley's academic work is in administrative law, civil rights, education policy, and domestic public policy generally. As a public servant, he has served in a number of senior White House positions and most recently as a senior policy advisor for Barack Obama. <laughs> Last but not least, it is now my pleasure to welcome the moderator for the session, Anya Kamenetz. Ms. Kamenetz is NPR's lead education blogger. She joined NPR in 2014, working as part of a new initiative to coordinate on-air and online coverage of learning. Before joining NPR, Ms. Kamenetz covered technology, innovation, sustainability, and social entrepreneurship for Fast Company magazine, and has contributed to a broad range of media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New York Magazine and Slate. And she has also appeared in documentaries featured on PBS and CNN. With that introduction, I'm going to turn things over to the moderator. Thank you all so much. Um, this is a really exciting moment. We've got an incredible panel here. My role, like a good classroom teacher, is to facilitate conversation amongst ourselves with an understanding that we, um, we're going to try to see each other's point of view even when we disagree. I may cut people off to make sure that there's equal time amongst us all, and I hope that you'll forgive me. Um, with the task before us, we're trying to imagine a whole new future, right, for education, uh, a public education that doesn't exist. And so first I'm going to ask the panelists each to return us to a moment in history. So. Many times we talk about what remains to be done, and I think we'll talk a lot about that today, but what point in the past do you look toward when you're thinking about the struggle, and especially the struggles that are most salient for you at this moment? And I'll, I'll, we'll go down the line with this one if you want to, Chris. <laughs> So you took my $20 bill, but you're starting with me anyway. Is that the <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Well, I have to, I have to confess that uh, as, uh, as a lawyer, uh, I can't help but think to uh, the important Supreme Court cases and the legal struggles that, uh, that have taken place over the decades. Um, I think what, what's particularly important uh, is not only to reclaim the hopefulness 
uh, that was born from successful litigation in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, but also to recognize that in addition to sort of a rights-based anti-discrimination construct uh, that initiated the modern civil rights movement, we've now supplemented that with various kinds of statutory and regulatory commitments to improving equity and excellence for each and every child. Uh, so I take the hopefulness, I'd like to reclaim the hopefulness of the past, but recognize that in this new day, uh, we've embraced a broader set of paradigms uh, in the struggle for education justice. It's, it's still damned hard, uh, but uh, I'm still hopeful. Thank you. So it's a little hard for me to not think about where I come from. I was born in Yucatan, Mexico, and my experience has been of straddling these regions, these spaces, these nations. Um, and, and to think about a moment when I was growing up that was significant in terms of our understanding of education in Mexico was um, the colonization of Franciscan friars who were the first educators uh, under the Western model to um, educate children and families in Mexico. Growing up, I and then learned when I came to, this, to the United States that that was the same history for people here, especially in California where I live that those experiences of the missions across all of that area and those regions had lasting effects. But there were movements and there were moments in, in that history that liberated spaces for learning even then and now. So I'm hopeful for the liberation of more spaces of education that mirror in some way that, that trajectory that I'm talking about um, uh, of, of history. I'll stop there. Thank you. So I was on the witness stand in the Federal District Court in Greenville, Mississippi in the spring of 1963. Kennedy was president still. Bobby Kennedy was the Attorney General. Uh, Burke Marshall was the Assistant yeah. Attorney General for Civil Rights. Uh, I was working as a field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and we had been grease gunned on the highway. Jimmy Travis had caught a bullet, uh, and in response, we had decided to converge on Greenwood in LaFleur County. Um, we offered food because they had cut off the federal allotments, and we told people, look, uh, you can't get your food because of the politics, and so if you want any of this food, you have to go down and register to vote, just straight up. And so then um, we got hundreds going down, and we were arrested. Uh, Burke uh, filed suit against the city of Greenwood and had our cases removed to the federal courts. We bust over uh, busloads of sharecroppers and filled up the courtroom. Uh, Burke sent John Doerr to be our lawyer, <laughs> and I was on the witness stand, and the federal district judge, Clayton, just had one question. Why is SNCC taking illiterates down to register to vote? So sharecropper illiteracy and sharecropper education was the subtext of the right to vote in the 1960s, and sharecropper education says uh, you are pre-assigned work, and you get the education at best for the work which you've been pre-assigned. And so my question to my fellow panelists um, and my question to everybody here, aren't we now still doing sharecropper education for the vast majority of our children? <laughs> and I think this erupted in the last election it was the subtext of the election which nobody talked about because we are giving children an education tied to industrial 
technologies of the 20, 20th century, and we have yet to decide as a country that we're actually going to educate our children to the demands of the information age, knowledge work, economies of the 21st century. Mm. Mm -hmm. So how do you follow that? <laughs> uh, but I thank you for uh, bringing in that historical moment from where I started, because certainly that shaped my thinking. I am the granddaughter of those sharecroppers. My grandparents were sharecroppers. And, and so when I think about the absolute progress, I, I think, well, yes, there's been a tremendous absolute progress when I think about that moment that in the 1920s my grandparents were born and my parents went, my mother barely went to college with 50 cents in her pocket and she wanted to make sure that all of her children would be able to get a very good education in the rural South. But um, I'm also, when I wanna think about that moment that I think is a missed moment in American society, I wanna go post-World War II. When the GIs came home, prior to Brown versus Board of Education, I think this was a missed moment in American society because I think that was the moment at which the United States could have recalibrated somewhat mm -hmm. um, and, and in some ways mitigated the kind of cumulative disadvantage that we have today. So absolutely we've gotten somewhere since the time when my grandparents were coming up and they had a fourth grade education. But I think that we're in a, this is the bind that we're in as educational researchers and practitioners and thinkers. We have fundamental ecological dissimilarity in American society in our schools and communities. And, and what, by that, what I mean is if you think about the entire ethos, context in which every American child is growing up in, and think about their social categorization, it's not, we're not comparing apples to apples or oranges to oranges. They're so radically disparate. And then what we're trying to do as researchers is then try to use our tools and interventions to try to reduce disparities within the context of ecological dissimilarity. We've not, we're not radically changing the disparate context. We're trying to go within schools to at least create some reformist uh, improvement in some ways, but we'll still have an enduring narrative of disparities, be disparities because the relative disadvantage will endure. And for me, that's the biggest issue to try to reconcile as we think forward. How, in the context of ecological dis dissimilarity, can we possibly radically reduce the kind of inequality that we see posed before us in education? And sure, some of us will get through the door like myself, and others, but when we think about on average that two thirds of African American, Latinx, and indigenous Native American kids are born within 200% of the poverty line today, whereas it is, it is the opposite for white and Asian children in this country, it's hard for me to imagine that we won't have this persistent inequality that we have, and I think that's where we have to be thinking radically in terms of the future, so I'll stop there for now. So I'll go back to a similar period, uh, 1964, when President Johnson uh, declared war on poverty, because the absolute progress that Prudence mentioned, I think, can be um, uh, pinpointed uh, in those early days. A lot of people um, say uh, the war on poverty is a failure because poverty is high and poverty is high. A lot of people say the war on poverty is a failure because we still have enormous education gaps. But if you go back and read uh, what President Johnson said, uh, that's the kind of hope uh, that we haven't seen uh, from our officials in a long time. In a list of priorities, uh, uh, eliminating discrimination uh, was key. Uh, Johnson said, um, uh, in addition to making the case that uh, we often hear that today, uh, people who graduate high school without the skills aren't going to earn what people who have skills earn, so it's important uh, for us as a nation, we'll have higher uh, uh, productivity and higher economic growth uh, if people are better educated. But Johnson also said, the basic case against discrimination is not just economic, it's that uh, discrimination uh, affronts human dignity. And this kind of uh, broad linking of a war on poverty and a war on d uh, discrimination uh, is what um, 
led to the start of Head Start, the, hard, the start of Job Corps, the start of federal intervention in higher education. Unfortunately, the economic changes that have gone on over the last 40 years and the political changes uh, that have gone on since the Reagan era have done a lot to uh, set back uh, the rapid progress that was made in the decade after the war on poverty. So I would uh, say if we're looking for the kind of uh, global focus on reducing poverty and discrimination, uh, it would be useful to go back and uh, look at that uh, period. Um, again, um, recently we've had the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, the Kerner Commission, so a lot of this uh, has been uh, the focus of uh, at least scholarly attention, certainly not uh, attention in this administration. It, it's really neat and good to be back in Lenape territory, a place that I've lived uh, for 18 years prior to um, moving to uh, Toronto just about three years ago. And um, I hope that my words in this panel and then also that my words and actions at this conference are in good relationship to people who have been responsible to this territory since time immemorial. And I feel precocious to be talking on this panel and then to be at the end of the line and talk about 1491. Mm -hmm. and, and there have been many literary projects and comedy projects made by indigenous people who have imagined 1491 and what education looked like on Turtle Island in 1491 or in the territory that I am from, that my sister is from in the 1700s before Russia colonized the, uh, the Aleutian Islands before the United States purchase of Alaska. When we talk about the idea of time immemorial, that is, um, that is an admission of the, our inability to conceive of time without being so arrogant as to think that um, a lifetime or, or several generations is any match for what, the, um, for the kind of long histories of indigenous peoples and relationships to place, but also the much longer futures of indigenous peoples in relationships to these same places. I don't think that there has been a time in U.S. history in which education has done right by indig for indigenous people. Mm. I don't think that there is... <clears throat> I don't think that there has been a time in U.S. history that U.S. history has done right by indigenous people. Mm. And I say that not to sour the conversation, but to try to um, remind not just of the long past of indigenous peoples here, but the longer futures. And so the questions that I like to ask when I think about the long futures of indigenous peoples here in this territory is what does it, what does a public education project look like that does not insist on the permanence of the nation state as it currently stands? What does the project of public education look like when it doesn't imagine settler colonial violence as its main way of um, setting about relations? And what happens when we uh, hold seriously the imaginations that indigenous communities have held long before settlers got here and will hold long after settlers reimagine their relationships to be in this place, not as settlers anymore. What happens when it's those imaginations that guide us into the future? Hmm. Okay, so through the sharing of these histories, we 
all learn something and we place it in a context larger than one country or one history or even countries or histories. Um, and to turn to the point of futures now with those past, those histories in mind, what's most urgent? What comes next? Where do we go from here? What is on the top of people's minds? And particularly with the toolbox that the people in this room share, which is, and the lens that you share as scholars and researchers, um, because that's a particular part to play, right? Um, to have, to use those tools to make change. You should start down there. <laughs> I, is that all right with you? That's okay. Okay, go for it. <laughs> you did do your promise to not start with me the last time. Yes. <laughs> um, I really believe that in order to bring about other futurities, that it's important for educational researchers and education, uh, education, um, uh, I can't, I'm just lost the word educators. Um, <laughs> so educational researchers and educators to attend uh, more meaningfully to the violences of settler colonialism and to anti-blackness. And the ways that these are foundational to the origin story of the United States. Also, um, because various rights-based projects have not attempted yet to address settler colonialism or anti-blackness, um, the ways in which schools can be sites of, of, of reproducing and continuing those long legacies here. I think that um, there are different ways that different disciplines are attending to settler colonialism and to anti-blackness. And I would encourage educational researchers and educators to engage more meaningfully into education, our in indigenous studies and into black studies, uh, which are fields in which these questions are very rigorously engaged. But I think that there's something really important about the work of educators and educational research, our field of education, which cares so much about relationships and cares so much about relationality, and at its basis cares so much about change and the possibilities of change. I think that, there, um, that our field is the right field to be pursuing questions about how do we come into relationship with each other in a different way? How do we imagine ourselves to be in relationship outside of settler colonial relations? Um, I think that our field is actually very well suited to be pursuing these questions. And so when I talk about um, prioritizing um, unsettling settler colonialism and attending and, and dismantling structures of anti-blackness, I, I, I say that with a great deal of credibility for our field as being a field that can attend meaningfully to that work. I say that um, as something that I think is quite practical for us to turn to, not a, not a theoretical project that's outside of our grasp or outside of our lifetimes, but actually something that we need to attend to in order to, um, to imagine another future for our relationships to the planet. Sheldon, will you yield? Can, can I jump in? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, I guess I want to approach the futures question by uh, talking about the, f let's make it about me. I want to, <laughs> I, 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 here's the sort of future that I think, uh, that, that I'd like everybody to work towards. Um, and it's sort of in two parts. One is I think that a lot of this discussion has been about the right ethical frame for designing, imagining our future. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm a policy guy, uh, a policy wonk, so I want to say something in both of those realms. Um, the ethical frame I think we need is one that quite radically focuses on the child and makes us adults in the system 
uh, assume responsibility for seeing to it that each and every child uh, has uh, an effective instructional strategy, has the tools that they need uh, to be successful to students. Now, if your commitment is to each and every child, then when my daughter is struggling with chemistry, the teacher feels an obligation to find a strategy that will work for my daughter. And it may not be the same strategy that will work for the boy who sits next to her or the girl who is in the next period. Um, and if we focus on serving each and every child and that level of individualization, it means reinventing the teaching profession and giving teachers the kind of preparation, the kind of support, the kind of professional autonomy, uh, the kind of compensation that goes along with having the facility to provide what's needed for each and every child. It implies an agenda about restructuring schools. Uh, it implies an agenda about mobilizing uh, resources outside of schools to support student success, period, paragraph. Now let me talk about policy. What's hopeful to me about this moment in policy, well, first of all, I should say I'm hopeful about this moment in politics. I mean, Washington, D.C., notwithstanding, in my work, what I am feeling is across the country in red states and blue states, more attention is being given to issues of equity than in my professional life. And even in the face of Reagan-esque budgeting, uh, there is still, I think, more than lip service in red states and in blue states uh, to narrowing disparities and lifting achievement. Uh, when it comes to budgets, that's a different matter, but at least I think we have a political moment. Hmm. Now, the policy point I want to make is this. In the last 15 years or so, research in the brain sciences in particular have started to give us a new understanding of the ways in which stresses, adversity related to poverty, related to race, the ways in which those stresses affect learning through changes in neurochemistry, through changes in neuroanatomy. I mean, if the hippocampus is affected, by boiling your brain in cortisol year after year so that memory is impaired, if what the stresses in your community are creating difficulties in terms of forming adult relationships, it's no wonder that so many of the interventions in education policy we try have effect sizes that are too small because it turns out that for children who have faced these kinds of adversities, giving, giving them a better teacher is not enough. We have to take advantage, the research is telling us, the research is telling us that we can take advantage of neuroplasticity, of the malleability of the brain to provide interventions and supports so that even children who are affected by adversity can recover and be successful as students. But it cannot come from schools alone. What we have to do is recognize that it requires the mental health agencies, the housing agencies, the criminal justice agencies, the public health bureaucracies, that all of those entities have to have baked into their missions support for student success. They have more zeros in their budget than we do in education. Mm -hmm. right? They've got the range of professionals that need to augment what educators can provide. That's the way we're going to be able to help each and every child. That's the way we're going to be able to move the needle on these disparities that are driven by poverty, by race, by adversity. And the science, I think, is giving us cause to hope for a better future for those children.
to respond okay. to the, this yeah. is an invitation that you're um, making to all of us, and in particular teachers, with a um, large white teacher population. There are important uh, benefits, assets, but there are also tremendous challenges. I am not a big data person. I work ethnography. I go to the local schools and I try to understand what happens on the ground. Last year's statistics for dropouts in the uni Los Angeles Unified School District, I could not believe 9,000 students dropped out, Latinx students dropped out of high school. And I'm at the other end in San Francisco looking at children entering a school, an elementary school. And I'm seeing that there is a pathway for these children that begins to happen of tremendous support, but also of some deeply ingrained attitudes and perspectives that have to do with privilege mm -hmm. and whiteness that get on to be um, acted on uh, in these classes, in these classrooms. And to me, the invitation is to think about the beyond the needs, but also the needs of teachers to understand their position mm -hmm. as privileged, right, in a system that has endowed them with the ability to become teachers and to work with that, um, within that, um, that point of reflection to improve to the self rather than be mm -hmm. thinking about helping others, but to, but to think about uh, elevating the spirit. Uh, and this is actually a spirit of not just giving, but it's a spirit of giving back, right? Giving back of, um, in terms of like the, um, the benefits accrued that mm -hmm. has made someone an academic or a teacher. Right, so like just looking at the, at the tension between these two poles, the dropout students, the, new, the kids coming into the system, and in, in hoping that there is a way to um, connect these two so that there are no more of these uh, uh, really difficult decisions that children are forced to make and parents to leave the school system. So it's just an invitation. Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying as an invitation to think deeply about one's position in the system as well. And, and I, I appreciate the treatment of the consequences on our, on our kids, on our youth. Um, but I, I'm a structuralist, and so I have to put this out there. I want to figure out how we're going to mitigate or eradicate the stressors. And the stressors are poverty and racism and discrimination and low uh, unemployment and all of the things that drive the conditions within the context that then infiltrate or permeate the walls of schools that our children have to carry with them. And I, you know, there are a lot of us who want to, are resistant to the fact that, well, you don't want to be overly determinate. You don't want to say that just all those things, kids can't learn in the midst of those things. We know kids can. I mean, a lot of us are here and we did learn in the midst of that, right? But I'm talking about on average. I'm not talking about a few boats, a few individuals. I'm talking about how you reduce the averages and the ethos within the context. And so one of the things that I think in terms of reimagining educational research is that I think it's time to stop fetishizing and objectifying research on those of us who have been marginalized and oppressed and also start to work on what's going on in affluent and privileged and white communities. Yes. There have to be interventions in those communities too. And it's not now understanding their limited resources, but I fundamentally believe if we're gonna to go to a micro or psychological intervention, we're gonna to have to change mindsets. Mm so that we can think about how we really allocate resources and share and build emp empathic people. And there's a lot of self-interest that drive political behavior in our society. And we see where the consequence of that, and then it gets compounded in our society. So I, I'm not saying it's an either or, I think it's a both and, but I think it is also time for us to invest more research attention to how we're going to cultivate people's true understanding of the how the history got us to where we are and how if we're going to have a radical, more reimagined, inclusive, incredibly rich future where it doesn't look so patterned this way, 
we're going to have to change those who are privileged too. And what will that take? What will that take? And I think research has to go there as well. And that can be through teachers too. <laughs> that can be through principals. But it's, it, but, it, but it's also going to be conjoined with social and economic policy in different ways, in creative ways, I believe. So. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to pick up on the last part of what Chris said because um, the following came to mind. Um, there's some excellent colleagues. We've got three Berkeley people on the panel and now I'm going to quote more Berkeley people. Um, <laughs> Hillary Hoynes and Rucker Johnson are both scholars at the Goldman School at Berkeley who have done uh, really important research. Um, uh, Hoynes and her colleagues have a paper showing that the introduction of the food stamp program, uh, if you compare kids born before the program and afterwards, led to not just uh, increases in high school graduation, reductions in obesity. Rucker Johnson has shown that kids who went to Head Start, kids who went to schools that got the early Title I funds were more likely to graduate, have better earnings, better health, mental health, less likely to be incarcerated. So at one level, the research of the last 10 to 15 years has really shown the importance of the structural problem. It's relatively easy to do that if you have the political will. The last time I was really optimistic was in 2009. I know right when it was, uh, it was when uh, President Obama passed the Stimulus Act because it raised food stamps. It did a lot of these things. Now, I'm reading in the paper that the current administration would like to put a work test on food stamps, a work test on Medicaid, because uh, I would say they have the erroneous view uh, that people don't want to work in contrast to the view that people want to work, but employers <laughs> won't hire them. But in some sense, we're doing exactly uh, the opposite. So um, uh, I think the research uh, clearly has demonstrated uh, that you can achieve educational gains through these structural patterns. I think this is, uh, ties on to what Prudence just said. The issue is, why do um, uh, uh, states reject uh, the Medicaid expansion of the Affordable Care Act, which the federal government was going to pay almost 100% of. What, what kind of view do they have? Much less, uh, I'm not even asking them to give up their holding to white privilege. I'm just saying, you know, accept a federal program that would provide Medicaid with somebody else paying for it. Look, so I don't think there's I any... Wanna, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, jump in here with um, a pick up on uh, Sheldon's point um, about political will and uh, Prudence's point about our mindset. So I have a question for all of us, uh, which is, uh, what is your mindset about the preamble to the Constitution? So the preamble says... Uh, we the people, that's the subject. It's a simple declarative sentence. The verb is present tense and active, right? Do, ordain, and establish. Um, and then it has an object, this Constitution for the United States of America. So my question is, do we own the preamble? In other words, do we take it as something that belongs to us. We are the people who ordain and establish this Constitution. Do we acknowledge that the people who wrote the preamble were just a bunch of undocumented people? <laughs> Patrick Henry was upset, right? Who gave them the right to say we the people, right? He should, they should have said we the citizens of the several states, but they couldn't, right? They couldn't do that, right? And as soon as they said we the people, and think about it, right? There is no place in the Constitution 
where you can find out who the we are. So the idea that we should have Supreme Court justices who tell us, well, it's the written constitution and you have to go to the written constitution to know what it really means, we can't even know who the we are from the constitution, right? So do we want to own the preamble? That's the question. And when I think about the civil rights movement, right, what was going on was the, the freedom rider going through Alabama was not thinking, oh, I'm a citizen of Alabama, woe is me. The freedom rider was thinking, I'm a citizen of this country and it means something, right? And so for voting, for public accommodations, for education, for healthcare, for work, right, all the movement of the, the civil rights movement, they were looking, well, what does it mean to be a citizen of the country? Uh, it should mean something. It's another way of saying, what's the reach of the we the people of the preamble, right? Now, the only place that we got the reach that we wanted was public accommodations. That's the only place in which we got constitutional status at the federal, at the state, and at the municipal level, right? And we didn't get it at education. So uh, here's a challenge, right? Uh, Goodwin Liu, who is the, on the Supreme Court of California, uh, we held a, a meeting at Howard University in 2005 calling for a constitutional amendment uh, for purposes of education. Uh, Goodwin Liu spoke. He, at that time, he was on your faculty at UC Berkeley. Right? My faculty? <laughs> your faculty. I'm sorry. He was working for Chris. Right? So um, he went on and published three papers dealing with education, equality, and national citizenship. And his first paper was in the Yale Law School Journal. And in it he said he was arguing that the 14th Amendment authorizes and obligates Congress to uh, provide, ensure a meaningful floor of education opportunity throughout the nation. And the argument focuses on the opening words, the guarantee of national citizenship, not the equal protection, right? And that those opening words are not just legal, he did the research. They call for full membership, effective participation, and equal dignity of all citizens in the national community. So my point is, unless we raise this issue of education to the level of the constitutional status of everybody in the country, documented or not, right? And unless we do that, uh, we are not going to work our way out of any of these problems. Right? And as for teachers, Chris, we don't have them, and we have no intention of providing them. Hmm. So we have the, does anyone want to respond? Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, so I agree with everything that's been said, but I'm just living on a different planet. <laughs> Um, I'm not saying it's a better planet, it's just the one I'm stuck on. Um, my first job out of graduate school <clears throat> was on the domestic policy staff in the Carter White House, uh, and I was in charge of welfare reform, social security, food stamps, and so forth. I was about 12 years old. Um, and. Uh, since then, I have felt myself to be quite a student of the politics and the policy uh, around poverty issues. And uh, I think that it is true our students would be much better off without poverty. And I don't mean that in a glib, in a glib way. I mean, poverty is crippling is crippling. Unless we do things to either eliminate poverty or, and this is my agenda, mitigate the effects of poverty to the extent we can. The politics of those two agendas, eliminate poverty, 
mitigate the effects of poverty are radically different. Mm. Are radically different. I can see immediately how to make progress on the mitigation agenda. I can see the science to give us guidance about how to do it. I can see wisps of the political will to engage parts of that agenda. But I think the political will and indeed the moral conviction to pursue the broader agenda, which involves a fundamental reordering of our politics and of the way our economy operates, it's far more problematic and my children can't wait. My children can't wait for that agenda to be prosecuted effectively. We've been working on it. We've been working on it for many generations. And that agenda will not be finished anytime soon. So God, bless people, God bless people who pursue that, but it's not either or. And well, so my plea question, is that we Chris. also pursue this, this more modest but nevertheless heroic so, so agenda. So what do you do? Lamar Alexander right, yeah. asked for the National Academy of Sciences to tell the nation what it needed for STEM, for the workforce and education for the 21st century. The National Academy of Sciences issued their report in 2005, Gathering Storm, right? They asked, they asked that they say the 10 top things to do in order Right? The first thing they said, the country needs to provide 10,000 more teachers annually for math and science and needs to fund those who want to go into underserved communities. So what did Bush do? He did a Hail Mary, right? He said, America competes, no legislation, no money. They reissued the report in 2010. What did Obama do, right? Another Hail Mary, 100,000 in 10 years. No legislation, no money. What are you going to do? What are you talking about? What I will say is that I will bet you dollars to donuts that in at least half of the states, efforts are being made to increase the number of teachers going into STEM and improve the STEM pipeline. Now, wait a minute, wait, 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 what, Bob. Teach for I'm America? not saying, I'm, no, 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 no. No, I'm saying Prudence and I were just having a drink yesterday and we were talking about what Berkeley's going to try to do to improve it. I mean, it is happening across the country. It is inadequate. The states what don't have any you, money, Chris. What I'm telling you, Bob, it, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're the one who's, you're, you are the one who is saying, let's get rid of poverty. So I can say back to you, states don't have the money, Bob. But so I, so, so, no, 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 no. Let Cleo and Prudence speak for herself, and let, let me clarify. I don't actually think we'll ever have a society where inequality or any form is completely gone. I'm not that, that Pollyanna-ish, okay? What I'm trying to suggest, though, is if we're going to continue, when we think about what we're expecting young people to do in their adulthood, yes. they're a part of a market and a competition, and it is always comparative and relative to others. Right? And so what I'm trying to do is to increase the opportunities that an overwhelming percentage of all groups are, are even reach or approximate to the extent we can a more normal distribution of who's going to get access. That is not patterned. Of course, yes. Because it's so terribly skewed right now. And, but, that, but that means that we have to reduce. Maybe I, should, I said the mitigation or the reduction. I would love the eradication. That's not going to happen in my lifetime. But we, it's not going to reduce. And let's talk about race, because I need to talk about that for a moment. Let me just talk about race for a moment. There was a study that was just released a yes. few weeks ago by the economist Raj Chetty and his colleagues. His data show, although it's only about 5%, of African-American kids who live in, under the best conditions, whatever that means, because racism is never gone, under the best conditions, the intergenerational mobility rate was still so stark for those under the best conditions. 
right? And so for me, what's troubling is we sit here and we talk about, I know we want to move more boats up, and I keep thinking, well, we get them into the better neighborhoods, into the better schools, and they're going to still have an intergenerational mobility if, predict, if it's predicated on his model, because we haven't got rid of the, the, one of the real problems. We haven't reduced one of the real problems, and that is anti-blackness. And I have to say, I agree, I don't know how to I'm not sure how we're going to destroy the United States as a nation state. I would love to learn more about that and think about it. I'm not making fun of it because I'm, I'm trying to be pragmatic, but I think that is actual. When you ask what is the antithesis of settler colonialism, it is fundamentally undoing the nation state as it's been made. That's how I understand it. And so, so you're saying that's never going to happen. And so we'll never get rid of poverty, and we'll never get rid of racism. So then we'll be talking about enduring relative disadvantage for the rest of our careers. And no, 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 no. Many no, of us no. make a lot of careers off of that. No, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, no. Here's what. I'm, here's what. Look, when I, I in, in a, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, I co-chaired the National Commission on the National Commission on Education Equity and Excellence. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, on the first day that that commission met, and look, this included the, the president of the NEA, the president of the AFT, the president of five national civil rights organizations, a bunch of terrific uh, education researchers, et cetera, okay? On the first day of the meeting, we all agreed the biggest problem is poverty. And we all agreed, let's not talk about it. Mm. We said, let's take responsibility for figuring out what we as educators can do in the face of poverty while other people work on poverty. Let's work on what we can do to mitigate the effects of poverty while other people are working on these other agendas that we all believe are important. Because if, if everybody in this room, everybody at this conference goes out tomorrow and tries to do something about homelessness, Who's going to do something about each and every child in the classroom while we're waiting for homelessness to, to be done away with? That's my point. Different think, agendas, different folks have to pursue them. Ours should be ours. I think one of the things that I would love for our field to really take up is our questions about what are our theories of change? Mm. How is it that we believe that change really happens? Is it happening because we are all doing our own things? Or is it happening because we all decide to work on something all at once? Is it because we say that some projects are impossible while others actually need for those projects to be really possible because otherwise we're not going to survive? Um, I would like to put on the record that I am also a policy person. That's what my training is in, my work is in urban education policy, and I feel like we need to ask questions about who has the authority in this territory to make policy. Who are we turning to in terms of which leaders are we turning to in order to say you have the right to make policy here? We do have alternative ways of understanding how to be in relationship to each other, be in relationship to land and water in this place that is informed by deep, long-held, and again, long into the future relationships to this place. Indigenous societies have persisted alongside this settler colonial society and have ways of <laughs> Um, understanding policy, understanding poverty as something completely produced by relationships hmm. to ideas of wealth and scarcity and abundance that are not from this territory. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I want to start to bring in people's questions so that we have as much participation as we can. And actually, this question pertains to each of the women on the panel, um, not just by happenstance of what you've commented on. Um, the question is, does changing the mindset, and Dean Carter, you talk about changing the mindset, mean studying cultural aspects of social inequalities? I'm sorry, say that. Does changing the mindset 
I guess, essentially, essentially of affluent people involve mean studying cultural aspects of social inequalities? Mean studying the cultural aspects of social inequalities? That's a yes or no question. <laughs> does changing the mindset, does changing the mindset mean studying the, so, the cultural aspects of social inequalities? And I wonder what that means. I would love to have that operationalized more. What are the cultural <laughs> aspects of, is it because we're talking about the cultural aspects of social inequality when we talk about the moral and ethical uh, foundations of inequality. Mm -hmm. And poverty. Uh, and, 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 poverty. The, and that poverty is, yeah. So it's naturalized, sure it's cultural. I understand what that means. Does that mean um, understanding the values, the ethics that undergird the philosophy? Is it talking about, is it trying to invoke a culture of poverty or talking about the mindsets of those who are disadvantaged and marginalized? Um, does it mean to take about, talk about the moral or cultural poverty of those who are privileged and don't think about the other? I mean, it could be all of those things, yes. So, uh, I mean, we have to understand human nature, I, th I think, and think about how we're socialized and conditioned, uh, I would say. Okay, anyone else? Oh, we have five, I just was handed a piece of paper that says we have five minutes left. That's not true. Oh. <laughs> but does anyone else, do That's either enough. of you want to speak to this quickly, and I'm gonna... I think it's about values. Okay, excellent. Um, As is politics. I feel like a really uh, terrible like goddess in charge of all of these people's questions and thoughts, but I'm sure they'll all buttonhole you and get their own responses. Um, but I'm going to pick this one um, because it's about teachers. How do we work for the liberation and empowerment of teachers in mm. their work in the context under surveillance and punishment? For example, evaluations, always under command of external authorities, the domination of technical and corporate interests in the curriculum, and also, how do we liberate children and youth from the standards and testing regimes? Good question. Yeah, that's a good question. We should turn these two back to the public, back to the <laughs> yeah. audience. I'm yes. sure everyone has these ideas. These are really but, good questions. Yeah. But may I take a stab at this in terms of the teachers and liberating um, students and teachers from the grip, right? from the grip of structures that prevent them from thinking sometimes, right? Um, I, I, you know, when I was listening uh, and hear a conversation about policy and the importance of uh, changing things because there is no, there, you know, it, it's gonna happen in our, in our lifetime. Some of this is going to happen. Uh, the long durée of life is, is incredibly, you know, long, hence the word, but, um, we are so stuck in interventions, right, that it prevents us from seeing that larger goal. And it also what interventions do is that they are, they are like chokeholds. They do not allow for anything else to happen while that intervention is taking place. Mm -hmm. So for example, language learners in schools, um, if policy changes, then curriculum changes and practices of the classroom change. And for whatever period of time, students and teachers can only do repetition of drills, right? That prevents them from daring and doing anything else beyond that. So I think it's important to question that very topic and the very um, solution that we see as interventions. Right? The, the very word itself is so problematic, right? That we have to fix, an intervention is to fix or to stop you know, direction. So I, I, I guess the, 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 the core of this comment <coughs> is the importance of having uh, the possibility of daring, of daring to say no individually and collectively. And I think that that is the only, from my point of view, the only place to liberate ourselves and to liberate our children in classrooms is to say no to those interventions that prevent us from moving right, forward. But I, I, the, lo the question is longer than this, so. Does anyone else want to respond? Or we'll move, we'll move on. I think on teachers, you have to change the job. Yeah. You have to change the profession. You have to do for teachers what we did for nurses. You go to the doctor's office, you now see a physician's assistant who a generation ago would have been a nurse. They have more Actually, autonomy, higher salary, they have more professional judgment is entrusted to them, and we expect them to be a critical part 
of tailoring your medical care to your needs. No. And that's what our children need. We actually have to do for teachers what we do for lawyers. <laughs> What's, I don't understand that. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't recommend it, but. <laughs> um, all right, so should we do one more question or should we wrap it up? Huh? One more, one more. Okay, one more, great. This is directed towards Chris and Prudence. How do we use the tools learned from neuroplasticity and the well being science? How do we use those tools in a way? that does not perpetuate the narrative that it's the child that needs intervention rather than the system. I agree, yeah. But how? That, no, I, I, that, that is frankly to me the hardest thing that I'm trying to work on right now. How do, I mean, if, even if you look at IDEA and, and special ed, uh, the stigmatization problem, um, uh, deficit models, all of that stuff. We have to figure out a way to take advantage of what the science has taught us, put that to use to the benefit of students, but in a way that tries to avoid those pitfalls. What I'm not in favor of is ignoring the evidence uh, because we have that anxiety. We've got to figure out a way to take that on front of yeah, I, I'm, I'm not in favor of, of ignoring the science or the evidence either, and I actually want to save lives in this moment. Um, and so we have to figure out how to use that to translate to policy and practice, to yeah. scaffold, and, and, and to nurture and to love our children in a better way in this mean world we live in. And so, so mm. the science is showing us, and it's not just children, by the way. I don't know how many of you saw the New York Times Magazine cover um, this past Sunday about maternal health. And, and, and the gaps are actually, you know, paradoxically, ironically, the gaps are higher for those who are more privileged, but who are black people, who are people of color, but this was on black women and maternity mortality and infant mortality. The gaps are higher. So what we're talking about is doing work to make sure that more of us can survive in the context of settler colonialism, anti-blackness, white supremacy, whatever you want to call it, poverty. There are all these issues that are interwoven throughout our lives. We can't get away from it because it's in the air and it's in the water. And some of us are managing to figure out how to be resilient, and those of us who can afford it can get therapy so that we're talking about what do we do for our children. Um, our children and our youth and what policies we can do to keep them at least on the tra trajectory to be, remain viable as productive individuals, thriving individuals. I think my concern, and I appreciate the question, my concern is to keep them productive, thriving, proficient, to still be in mostly secondary roles in our society. Because if we don't handle the structural in a more radical way, it's we're true. reproducing, it's class, social and class reproduction. And that's real, that's just a social fact, I think, society. That's why for the last 50 years, we haven't seen as much radical progress as we wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can I jump in? I think so, yes. Okay, so just following up on the issue about uh, the obligation of Congress, um, the Committee on Equal Opportunity in Science and Engineering, or CEOSE, a congressionally mandated body meets three or four times a year to advise NSF on its broadening participation effort. So in 2012, it recommended that NSF implement a bold new initiative focused on broadening participation of underrepresented groups in STEM, similar in concept and scale to NSF centers. So um, the Algebra Project, along with about 70 other institutions around the country, um, has been funded by NSF. Uh, and the idea is that uh, all these groups should try to figure out how the country develops national alliances to broaden participation in STEM, right? Um, so it, but the, where's the funding for that, right. right? And so where are the people in the country who are gonna hold Congress responsible for its obligations, right? What are we gonna do? What are you gonna do? Right, I mean, at this point, the idea of funding is, well, we just accept, 
you know, the dribs and drabs because we can't do anything about it, right? Mm. We do not have a political party, neither Republican nor Democrat, which is willing to take on this issue of, you know, the, the literacy requirements of the 21st century. Because if the kids, um, and stop and think, you know, um, the judge asking me that question in 1963, he was thinking about reading and writing. Math was not in his mind, right? But the transition into uh, the information age technology has put quantitative literacy on the table, along with reading and writing. If the kids don't get those three literacies, and if they don't have a safety net, they're headed for the criminal justice system. We know it, right? What are we going to do about it? We will not get the money until we have the political movement. And we won't have the political movement until we have a change in people's values, who they care about, who they think of as other. And that is a very hard agenda, but I think that's the necessary one. We're, I want to thank you all so much and, and hand it over to Deborah. Just, I learned so much. Um, but I really think what, what's going to stick in my mind from tonight are the questions. And that's, that's really the, the fodder for um, the further discussions here. What, what are your theories of change? Where do you start from in history? Who is going to be the participants? Who is included in the We the People? Um, what does science remain to tell us? What do we do first? Can we do it all at once? You know, what are the possibilities? So, you know, just sticking with those questions, I'm going to bring them home tonight, and I want to thank you, each of you. I learned so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anya, Chris, Patricia, Bob, Prudence, Sheldon, Eve, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being willing to have this sparky, fiery conversation that's pushing us and provoking us here with all of us witness. Um, I'm really struck with a couple of things. Um, first, Eve, your challenge to us about what is our theory of change and challenging us to think about that and also repeatedly referring to our field and Bob's reference to the we and are we willing to say the we and Patricia, you wrote to me about the we. We got a glimpse of what almost 17,000 people are gonna be intermingling here over the next five days. And what our hope was out of this session is that we got a glimpse of how the intersections among us could push us to think about what are we trying to get done here? What are we trying to understand? What are we trying to do? And even if those are different from one another, how do we learn that allows us to accelerate our work? How do we learn that over the next five days? And what our hope was for this session is this would spark us to think about how to use this year's meeting about the dreams, possibility, and necessity of public education, whatever that is going to mean, Eve, or whatever any of you is going to mean. I'd like to close with a quote from the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. from, as we know, we're marking 50 years since his assassination, and the quote I'd like to read is really marked by being talked about in the Vietnam War era, and it's one year exactly before he was shot. We're now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today, we're confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In the, this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. And he goes on a paragraph later to say, we must move past indecision to action. We must find new ways to speak for peace and justice throughout the world. Now let us begin. Let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. This is the calling of the sons of God and our brothers wait eagerly for our response. Shall we tell them the odds are too great? Shall we tell them the struggle is too hard? I think what we've heard tonight is no, and that we're here because we're committed to figuring out how we won't be sitting here having this exact same conversation 10 years from now, wherever we meet that year. Please join me in thanking our colleagues for starting us off so well. <laughs> <laughs>